Welcome to episode 478 of the Selling Your Screenplay podcast. I'm Ashley Scott Myers, screenwriter and blogger at SellingYourScreenplay.com. Today I am interviewing writer-director Matthew Bauer, who just did a cool documentary film called The Other Fellow. It's a fascinating story about having a famous name, in this case the name James Bond, affects people in their real life. Matthew goes into the whole story about how he put this film together, made it happen, and how he's been able to market it and get some traction with the film as well. So stay tuned for that interview. SYS's six-figure screenplay contest is open for submissions. Just go to www.sellingyourscreenplay.com slash contest. Our regular deadline is May 31st. If your script is ready, definitely submit now to save some money. We're looking for low-budget shorts and features. I'm defining low-budget as less than six figures. In other words, less than one million U.S. dollars. We've got, a, we've got lots of industry judges reading the scripts in later rounds. We're giving away thousands in cash and prizes. We've had a number of options and sales from the contest, and this is only our fourth year, so we're getting a nice bit of traction with these scripts. There's also lots of producers looking for high-quality, low-budget scripts that are short. We have the short film category for these scripts, so 30 pages or less. If you have a short script that's low-budget, definitely consider submitting that as well. If you'd like to learn more about the contest or check out some of the industry judges that are participating, just go to sellingyourscreenplay.com slash contest. If you find this episode valuable, please help me out by giving me a review in iTunes or leaving a comment on YouTube or retweeting the podcast on Twitter or liking or sharing it on Facebook. These social media shares really do help spread word about the podcast, so they're very much appreciated. Any websites or links that I mentioned in the podcast can be found on my blog in the show notes. I also publish a transcript with every episode in case you'd rather read the show or look at something later on. You'll find all the podcast show notes at www.sellingyourscreenplay.com slash podcast, and then just look for episode number 478. If you want my free guide, How to Sell Screenplay in Five Weeks, you can pick that up by going to sellingyourscreenplay.com slash guide. It's completely free. Just put in your email address and I'll send you a new lesson once per week for five weeks along with a bunch of bonus lessons. I teach the whole process of how to sell your screenplay in that guide. I'll teach you how to write a professional log line and career letter and how to find agents, managers, and producers who are looking for material. Really is everything you need to know to sell your screenplay. Just go to sellingyourscreenplay.com slash guide. So now let's get into the main segment. Today I'm interviewing writer-director Matthew Bauer. Here is the interview. Welcome, Matthew, to the Selling Your Screenplay podcast. I really appreciate you coming on the show with me today. Thank you, Ashley. I'm a, I'm a long-time listener of this. It's really cool to be here, Ashley. Uh, well, thank you. Thank you. So to start out, maybe you can tell us a little bit about your background. Where did you grow up and how did you get interested in the entertainment business? I was, grew up in Adelaide in Australia, which is a town uh, in Australia. Um, and I was always like the movie kid. I actually used to tape Entertainment Tonight at 3 a.m. every night and, and watch it the next day. And that was my kind of source of movie huh. news. Um, and then when I was there, I discovered the Bond films. Um, and that was my kind of big intro into cinema loving. Uh, and especially like the twisty thrillers of the 1990s were a big kind of thing of kind of elevating me into a hmm. certain kind of, especially the thriller genre. The Usual Suspects was a very big moment for me because that was the thing, that was the first thing that made me sit forward in my chair and go, oh my God, you, you know, this this movie really did a number uh, kind of on me. Um, and then kind of on from that, kind of the kind of, Lost and 24 were really big ones for me. And I always kind of like that stuff that kind of grabs you and throws you in different directions. Um, and then throughout high school, I was that kid who was like, you know, making short films in the AV club with me and my mm -hmm. mates, you know, jumping off balconies at school, trying to make action sequences <laughs> and that kind of thing. Um, and then what happened was when it got to kind of college time, um, NYU, which is the, you know, I'm, famous New York film school um, program. They decided to do like an international school of the NYU film program. And it was called Tish Asia and it was in Singapore. And it was designed to be like a carbon copy of the New York film program, hmm. but in Asia um, and with kind of much more of a focus on kind of international world cinema, but kind of still with that NYU ethos. And I was one of the, was accepted to be one of the kind of founding members of the very first class uh, of that school. Um, and that was a really good training for me, I think, as opposed to the kind of the New York program, which is obviously quite sort of New York America centric. Mm -hmm. The program there was 
kind of in a way, shit show is not a word I want to use, but it because it had just started, it, it was a little kind of, we were figuring it out as we went along. And so we had to learn how to get like a permit to film in like a national park in Singapore, for instance. Whereas at the New York school, you could have just asked someone in the class above you or one of your teachers mm-hmm. and they would have said, oh, call Jeff at the parks department. Yeah. And so I think that in terms of doing documentary work these days, that made me very confident just being like, okay, we'll, we'll do a shoot in Sweden, for instance, and and we'll we'll get the insurance for that, mm-hmm. yada, yada. Um, and I think that, yeah, taught, taught us a lot about how to kind of do international work on the fly, I would say. Now I'm curious. Um, a couple follow up questions. So number one, you're you're in this town in Australia. There's not like a bustling movie industry. Correct me if I'm wrong. And so how do you sort of? I mean, and and I say this as sort of someone that comes from the similar situation. I grew up in Annapolis, Maryland. There were no real artists of any sort that you could kind of look to as sort of a template. Um, how did you sort of figure out that this might be a career, or it even was a career, and just have the confidence to sort of move it to that next level and and go to Tish? Yeah, I, I'll tell you, actually, weirdly enough, the turning point for me was so I actually went into law school after high school because, you know, that thing where you kind of go, all my mates are going into medicine and things and I should go find a real mm-hmm. career. And I'd been doing that for a year. And actually, weirdly enough, one year of law school taught me so much about film producing that that I kind of, a lot of that, you know, knowing how to do contracts and that kind of thing actually was super useful later on. Um, but I actually went to, I was a member of commanderbond.net, which was one of the biggest James Bond websites at the time. And I was on the forums. And the first time I ever visited Los Angeles, the first night I went to like a, a gathering of all of those Bond fans. And there's still some really cringeworthy photos on the internet of all of us, you know, holding out fake guns and doing uh-huh. the poses. But that night I met a guy called John Cox, who was a, who was a Hollywood screenwriter. Um, and I met another guy who worked in like marketing at Miramax. And, and suddenly I was just with people who worked in the film industry. And I kind of said, Hey, I've made all these short films. And it was always my dream. And for these LA people, they were like, yeah, we do that. It's just our job. And, and that kind of made me go, ha, huh, okay. There are this, this is actually, you know, a career for people. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah. And then th- that kind of led to me applying for NYU, um yeah but yeah th- that was the turning point because at the time in Australia it was considered one of those you know one of those like pipe dream kind of mm-hmm. jobs actually within up the town I live in Australia now actually has a massive movie studio that that does a lot of Hollywood productions but yeah you know I always say is you know how there's the kind of joke like you know Mulholland Drive when Naomi Watts arrives in Hollywood with mm-hmm. the big dream of making it big and everyone's got that kind of thing of like that pipe dream of the small town actress making it big in the film industry. Well, every film has a hundred actors and one director. So it, it, you know what I mean? It's it's an even kind of crazier dream, I think, sometimes to, to have and to to figure out a way to to do it. Yeah. I'm curious. So as you went to NYU, um, what was your sort of career ambitions? Did you want to make documentaries? And this is going to get into the film that you've just finished. Um, or did you want to do narrative, you know, just more feature films? Yeah, I was always, funny enough, I'm actually staying with my old classmate from NYU, Han West here. And me and him got close because we were kind of like the Hollywood kids. I loved the Bond films and he loved the Michael Bay films. Mm-hmm. And so we kind of, because, you know, you have all the kind of more Tarantino-esque kids, you know, I, I can't tell you anything about <laughs> 70s Italian horror cinema, you, you know, but I can tell you everything about 24 and James Bond. And he was the same for like Michael, you know, Michael Bay, yeah, yeah. It's quite, brave, it's quite brave at a film school to go in and say my favorite director is Michael <laughs> Bay. Yeah. And so we that was always kind of my kind of angle on it. Um, but yeah, I I always kind of wanted to go into that kind of thing. And then when the idea for the other fellow cropped up, it was a documentary. So so I kind of shifted into documentary mode. We'd thankfully done a documentary class at film school, so I had some idea of mm-hmm. it. But also going to documentary, I, I, I was bringing a certain sensibility to it and, and a very cinematic sensibility. I wanted this to be a very cinematic mm-hmm. picture. And you'll see in this film, particularly in the reenactments we did, 
we cast really real actors. You know, weirdly enough, we cast the late Gregory Itzen, who's President Logan on on 24, um, in one of the key roles. And, you know, some really top British actors um, are there as well. And we we shot our reenactments like they were Hollywood films, no, not shaky camera, black and white, Dutch angle sort of style. So let's. I think that's a good segue to get into the other fella. Um, maybe to start out, you can just give us a quick picture logline. So what is this this film all about? So the other fella, our, our, our logline, our, our tagline is a film about men, real men named James Bonds. Um, the the logline is 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 an, an energetic exploration of male identity by the lives, adventures, and personalities of men named James Bonds. Um, yes, I. Log lines and taglines are very important to us because, well, the reason why is because the, the the name the other fellow is is an is a James Bond in joke. If if you've seen Honor Majesty's Secret Service, George Lazenby says about Sean Connery's James Bond, "This never happened to the other fellow," and what he means is this never happened to this other more famous James Bond. Mm. Um, and if the audience doesn't get that, then they kind of need our tagline to help them over the line of what mm. the film. Uh, is it about but yeah my, my film is about real men around the world who are somewhat in that same position of George Lazenby which is because their name is James Bond they are constantly living in the shadow of the cinematic James Bond who is obviously one of the most well-known probably the best known non-religious name uh in the world but also attached to the world's longest running media franchise um, and the film explores in particular what it's like to have this connection via your name to a, a media franchise phenomena. Mm -hmm. Where did this idea come from? It sounds like you're a big James Bond fan just in general, but um, but where did the idea for this documentary come from? What was the genesis of it? So I, I, mean, I never know. I'm not a brainstormer. I, I remember once at NYU that they, they, they said, uh, uh, today we're going to write down 10 ideas for, for films and, and that never computed for me personally. Hmm. Um, but I, I think it's a combination of things. I was in the early days of Facebook, I was a member of a, a Facebook group of people who had the same name as me, you know, those kind of things you yeah. could do on Facebook you'd never done before. And like, you know, when you try and sign up for Ashley Myers at Gmail and it's already mm -hmm. taken and you go, Oh, there must be another, Ashley Myers out there. And then if you try to sign up for Ashley Scott Myers and it was taken, you might go, is someone trying to impersonate mm -hmm. me? You know, and I think we've all had that thing where we receive an email to the wrong person who has our name. And so we would talk about things like that, like who's got the map bar at Gmail, who's got the Instagram handle. And mm -hmm. I think somewhere in there, I went, what, what if your name was James Bond? And you were asking these questions. And so it wasn't so much about, oh, my God, I bet these James Bonds have to put up with a lot of martini jokes and stuff, which they mm -hmm. obviously do. I was kind of more interested in about how this would cause a lot of kind of unexpected problems and the kind of things you wouldn't think about. Um, and definitely whilst the film does cover all the Aston Martin jokes and, and that kind of thing, in the end, it is kind of more about the kind of weird, almost sci-fi effects that happen. And particularly where the film, I've got to avoid spoilers too much, but especially the fact that when your name is James Bond, you're you're impossible to Google. Uh, you, you know, you, yeah. you can't be found on, on search engines and things in the way that a, a normal person would. And that stuff became the main sort of narrative thrust. Mm -hmm. Uh -oh. And that's so that's so funny you say that because I I think I was just the right age when Gmail was created and a lot of these things like Twitter because I have Ashley Myers at Twitter I have Ashley Myers at Gmail and I it's exactly what you have in fact I get so many Ashley Myers wrong emails I have a canned yep. response that I just send back now because some of the stuff is like medical documents I feel bad just deleting it or bills and stuff and so I have to send it out and then also this resonated yep. when you pitched it to me because again obviously a man named Ashley all of these other Ashley Myers are all women so there's always this gender issue that i have with, with my yeah, name no, with the confusion and, and we've had a lot with this film is that it, actually weirdly it's not just for men named james bond it speaks to people well, i keep hearing something new every day from people we talk to about it yeah um, we, we, we spoke with a, a, a reporter in australia called josh gay right and he's a straight man who has spent his entire life receiving homophobic <laughs> yeah. abuse yeah, but yeah. His name, but, all the, but on a more emotional level it's given him a real kinship with the gay community 
Huh. Um, and I think people, everyone, we, we we in society think a lot about how skin color and age and that kind of thing affect our perceptions in this world. But I think we often don't think so much about actually what our name does. Um, and I think that's what this film outside the Bond thing sort of really explores. Yeah, yeah. So let's talk about the writing process of this. I've never done a documentary, so I really don't even know what the writing process looks like. I did notice on this on IMDb, you have a writing partner, Renee Van Penevis. Um, and I'm curious, so maybe you can just describe what does the writing process look like? Do you guys start to kind of come up with an outline, then you shoot stuff, you start to edit it, and then you go back out, shoot more stuff? I just really just what is what does that mean being a writer yeah. of a documentary? How is the process and what does that look like between you? Yeah. You and Renee, I, I think I think process is is a nice way to to describe what is a somewhat haphazard process. To be fair, I mean, all I say is what we did with this film is we started out initially shooting a, a number of guys called James Bond, mm -hmm. um, and then during shooting, actually, most of the main cast you see sort of popped up during shooting. So, for instance, a, a, a man in Indiana was arrested for murder named James Bond and we ended up kind of interviewing him in prison so he sort of became a big part of it um but I, I would put it this way I remember when we graduated film school one of my best teachers Catherine Lindbergh she she said to us don't rush out and make a first feature straight away um and because she'd she'd actually sort of done it herself and she'd seen a lot of her other students do it and I'd seen a lot of my graduating class do that where you go out and you and you, you you get some money together for the script and you finance it independently and then you shoot for 30 days and at that point you're out of any money for reshoots so you're really stuck with what you have in the can what mm -hmm. what i've enjoyed about documentary is that this film was made over the course of about 100 shoots over a number of years each one of which cost about 250 dollars of you know weekend camera hire mm -hmm. and what we would do is shoot edit, shoot, edit, shoot, edit. And slowly over time, a film sort of started to, to take form. Um, there was one specific story in the UK, which ended up being a kind of real structural linchpin for us. And it was basically where all of my character, I'm having to avoid spoilers, but all of my characters are kind of having to deal with this force and somewhat of a dark force, if you will, of this James Bond phenomenon on their lives. Then we found one character who actually managed to take that force and switch it around and use it for good um, in a way that a a allowed them to sort of save their family huh. in a way. That became a real structural sort of linchpin for us. Um, and so we kind of cut around that. And then we got to a point of reenactment where we went, okay, because a lot of the story took place in the Second World War and there was this whole murder storyline and this whole stalker storyline. And, of course, we couldn't film those things. Another part was the original James Bond, the ornithologist, whose name Fleming stole to name the character. And that was in the 1960s. So we tried using archive and that didn't work in the edit at, at all. And so we went into the reenactment area. And so specifically my co-writer, was very active in writing those reenactments. And even though they're not spoken word, mm -hmm. there's no dialogue in those reenactments. There was a lot of work getting those correct and where they were in the edit. And so together we ended up with about a 130 minute long edit. And I then at that point did the thing, which I would recommend anybody does, which is go, okay, now we need to get a really good editor who can come in and look at what we have and kind of get it together. Um, so I found a really good editor about two years ago called Leslie Posso, um, who is a genius. And she 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 wasn't like a James Bond fan or anything. You know, she just came in and took what we had. Um, you know, and I used to have like these giant mind maps on my wall, these you know, 20 different characters and how they work together. She actually just looked at what we had and came back to me with a one and a half page long beat sheet. And she was like, I think this is your film. Huh. You, you know, and then I said, okay, go for it. Do a rough cut of that and we'll see where we go. And weirdly, that beat sheet that she came up with, that was the film. And I think sometimes you need that editor to look at everything you have and go, as long as they're good, mm -hmm. go, I think this is it. And yeah, she she was the one who kind of did the final nailing of the exact structure of it. 
Gotcha. And so that that was a question I had was, what does the structure of a feature documentary look like? I mean, in feet, you know, narrative feature, narrative fiction, there's the the breaking, you know, the the inciting incident, the, the plot one act break, the midpoint and those sorts of things. H how is documentaries typically structured? Yeah, I mean, I mean, I was taught all of that traditional screenwriting stuff, and I actually am a am, am a believer in it. And I think, especially on a first film, I wasn't really trying to break wheels here. Do, do you know what I mean? I think mm -hmm. your second film is the point when you might want to break the rules after learning them, yada yada. Um, so for this, yeah, this film actually does follow a pretty, uh, even though it, uh, hopefully the viewer never notices, but this does follow a pretty traditional sort of three act structure except you're actually jumping between different characters who are kind of taking the ball and going um I, I think the fun structural thing what i would say the difference between feature and documentary is as i said i, I was i was always a fan of films that had that big final twist in them like the usual suspects mm -hmm. or the kind of m night Shyamalan films the thing is in documentary you can't really do a final twist because you know, when you see it in a Shyamalan film, it's like, oh, that M. Night Shyamalan, he got me. You know, if you do that in a documentary where you're supposed to be following a story of real people, mm -hmm. then the audience is going to go, what did I bother? You, you know what I mean? If I was Yeah, it feels almost, it feels like a cheat almost. Yeah. And so what you see a lot in documentary is there's a midpoint twist rather than an end twist. So if you look at something like, I'm probably going to spoil some things here, but if you look at something like the, the imposter at the halfway point, you realize that the story you thought it was of this guy tricking this family, you realize that actually the family may have been the ones mm -hmm. behind the child's disappearance in like, say, searching for sugar man, at the midway point, you find out that actually this person you thought was a dead musician may actually be alive. Um, and so, yeah, for, for this film, there is a very significant midway turning point um, where the film, it, it, it's where the film you thought you were getting in the trailers mm -hmm. suddenly actually disappears and, and then the real story of the film actually takes form um yeah and i i don't want to reveal what that is but structurally that was probably the biggest part for us is how we did that reveal and when and mm -hmm. i originally wanted that reveal to happen at the end of the film because i was trying for a usual suspects thing and actually when you look at documentary you're like no that's not how it's done and the reason is yeah because you don't want to deceive your audience in like a real world thing mm -hmm. okay so once you guys had a cut of this film that you were you were happy with um what were those next steps you guys entered a bunch of film festivals um and maybe you can give us give us a little bit of sort of the sense of scope how many festivals did you enter how many did you get into and then how did that, that go about helping you secure distribution yeah, so we were trying to get a cut sort of ready for film festivals. Um, and so we we actually did a thing which I now regret, to be honest, is we were trying to get the entire kind of post-production sound and everything done before we went to festivals. Um, and 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 actually that kind of meant, actually after we got into festivals, we then decided to make some changes to the edit, which meant we then had to do a lot of that post-sound stuff again. Yeah. And if I was to do it again, and I would advise anyone else, it's that get that cut ready for festivals and then just with your editor and maybe the sound guy for one day, get the sound as good as you can, but don't do the whole mixing and everything mm -hmm. until you absolutely have to. Um, but yeah, we, I, I'll speak specifically for documentary. Um, ob obviously, you know what it's like. There's 5,000 film festivals. Mm -hmm. Which one are you going to submit to? To be honest, I always say this. I think most of them on Film Freeway are an absolute scam. Uh, they, they really are. And, you know, I would actually love to make a documentary about this. I think Film Freeway really needs to look at, it, at, at some of the festivals that are on there because a lot of them are these kind of like almost fake monthly film awards which are just there to get $200 entry fees out of people. Um, but but so anyway, you have to kind of figure your way through that. And so what we used is the, the Academy Awards has an Oscar qualifying list of the, the Oscar qualifying documentary festivals because most documentaries don't have a qualifying cinema run for the, for the Oscars. So if you win the top prize at one of these about 30 festivals, 
you then get Oscar qualification. And so that was our way to kind of go, okay, these are the top 30 documentary film festivals that we want to hit. And so we just started going down that list and submitting for those once we got into And I think we got rejected from the first two and we got accepted into the third one, uh, which was Doc Edge in New Zealand. Um, And because I'm Australian and it's close to New Zealand, that worked for our uh, world premiere. Um, and since then, yeah, we've done a few, we, we've continued submitting to that list. Um, but then also kind of via our sales agent have been submitting to to, to some other ones. Um, we, we had our US premiere at the Austin Film Festival. And that was because one of our producers, other short films was playing there. And so we kind of used a contact there. Hmm. Um, so yeah, it, it becomes kind of various, but it, but it can be hard. It's, it's the hardest thing we have is, you know, we have a, a spreadsheet of the festivals we want to submit to. And it is actually a lot of work getting down to the 10 you're going to submit to mm-hmm. that month and trying to work your way through. And, and like a lot of the better film festivals, especially in Europe, are not on film free for a and, and that sort of thing. Um, but, you know, you you only have so many $50 submission fees yeah. that you can send out. So you do have to kind of pick those quite carefully. Yeah. Yeah. Um- so I just like to wrap up the interviews just by asking the guest, is there anything you've seen recently that you thought was really great or even not so recently, just something that maybe was a little under the radar that you can recommend to our screenwriting audience? I, you know, I always hear this question on your podcast and I always go, I'm going to struggle with that because it, <laughs> it's it's very rare that something absolutely like grabs me and goes, mm-hmm. I absolutely love this. I, I, I always kind of say if people watch, what should I watch on streaming? I always tell them to watch The Jinx, um, which is The Lives and Deaths of Robert Durst, which was mm-hmm. like a kind of a five part um, documentary series from about like eight years ago mm-hmm. um i don't know if you've seen it but i have uh, seen it. i do i remember yeah it was it, i do remember watching it was excellent yeah when anyone ever asks i'm always like if you want to see the best thing ever mm-hmm. watch the jinx um yeah i think in terms of documentary and in terms of the kind of stuff i like which is like a thriller mm-hmm. documentary that has incredible twists and turns and yeah, that kind yeah. of thing um, incredible reenactment work in that as well. Incredible, like investigative journalistic mm-hmm. stuff. Um, yeah, what, if you haven't seen the Jinx, watch the Jinx for, yeah, from twenty twenty three. I'm I don't know right now. Gotcha, gotcha. Yeah, no, that's a great recommendation. I, I second that. Anybody who hasn't seen that, definitely check that out. How can people see the other guy? Do you know what the release schedule is going to be like for it? Uh, the film is called The Other Fellow. I People get this a lot. There's, uh, people do this all the time. They call it The Other Guy on the Fly. So, yes, The Other God, Fellow. Sorry about that. Um, I apologize. No, no, no. And weirdly, there's something about it that causes that to happen. I don't know, but it happens all the time. Hmm. Uh, but, yes, The Other Fellow, um, it's currently playing at cinemas here in New York. It will be playing um, in cinemas in LA. But I just think after this airs, I think that will have already happened. So where you can see it is on, it's available on Apple TV, okay. uh, Amazon Prime Video. It's there on just like YouTube. You can watch it. It's on Vimeo, Vudu, Spectrum, Comcast, um, mm-hmm. all those kind of places where you can kind of get on-demand content. Uh, it's, it's there. Uh, yeah. And otherwise, if you go to our website, Weirdly, a bit like your name, we actually do have everything The Other Fellow. So we have Facebook slash The Other Fellow, Twitter slash The Other Fellow, Instagram slash The Other Fellow, or theotherfellow.com. Uh, you'll find links on there as okay, well. Okay, perfect. Yeah, and we'll round all that show, that up for the show notes as well so people can just click over to that. Um, Matthew, I really appreciate you coming on and, and talking with me today. Good luck with this film and good luck with all your future films as well. Awesome. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure to be on. Hey, thank you. We'll talk to you later. Thanks, Bye. Bye-bye. SYS's From Concept to Completion screenwriting course is now available. Just go to www.sellingyourscreenplay.com slash screenwriting course. It will take you through every part of writing a screenplay, coming up with a concept, outlining, writing the opening pages, the first act, second act, third act, and then rewriting. And then there's even a module at the end on marketing your screenplay once it's polished and ready to be sent out. We're offering this course in two different versions. The first version, you get the course, plus you get three analyses from an SYS reader. You'll get one analysis on your outline, and then you'll get two analyses on your 
first draft of your screenplay. This is just our introductory price. You're getting three full analyses, which is actually the same price as our three pack analysis bundle. So you're essentially getting the course for free when you buy the three analyses that come with it. And to be clear, you're getting our full analysis with this package. The other version doesn't have the analysis. So you'll have to find some friends or colleagues who will do the feedback portion of the course with you. I'm letting SYS Select members do this version of the course for free. So if you're a member of SYS Select, you already have access to it. You also might consider that as an option. If you join SYS Select, you will get the course as part of that membership too. A big piece of this course is accountability. Once you start the course, you'll get an email every Sunday with that week's assignment. And if you don't complete it, we'll follow up with another reminder the next week. It's easy to pause the course if you need to take some time off, but as long as you're enrolled, you'll continue to get reminders for each section until it's completed. The objective of the course is to get you through it in six months so that you have a completed polished screenplay ready to be sent out. So if you have an idea for a screenplay and you're having a hard time getting it done, this course might be exactly what you need. If this sounds like something you'd like to learn more about, just go to www.sellingyourscreenplay.com slash screenwriting course. It's all one word, all lowercase. I will, of course, link to the course in the show notes, and I will put a link to the course on the homepage up in the right-hand sidebar. On the next episode of the podcast, I'm going to be interviewing filmmakers John Irwin and Brent McCorkle. They just did a feature film called Jesus Revolution starring Kelsey Grammer. They've worked in the faith-based family genre for a while now and bring some really significant insight into that whole genre. It's not a genre I know a ton about, but it's definitely a genre that I would say is underserved. So if you're, um, if it's something that you think you could write well, this is definitely something you're going to want to listen to um, and, and really take heart in what these guys say. They're really earnest transparent guys and they give a lot of great information next week um as I said, they talk about this new film, Jesus Revolution, that they have coming out, um, but just talk about their careers in general and kind of how they got to this position that they are now writing and directing these sorts of films. So keep an eye out for that episode next week. That's the show. Thank you for listening.